right. Yeah. Hallelujah. So good. And Jakey, I'm so glad you go to our church, man. I love the way that you worship. Come on. Yeah. Let's go. So fun. I'll need some of that today. Okay. Uh, so good morning, Antioch. It's good to see you. Uh, this Sunday is a big Sunday. Something really big has happened. Okay. It was Amy Johnson's birthday this weekend. Woo! <laughs> nice job. And mine, but, you know, it's fine. It's whatever. Um, oh, and our high school seniors have graduated. Congrats, guys. Nice job. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, this Sunday is graduation Sunday, um, where we celebrate our graduates by having student ministry take over the service. Wasn't that awesome, our worship service? I mean, that was amazing. I love it. Um, for me, this is a very special Sunday. Uh, I am now starting to graduate students that I have had in eighth grade. So I've seen them with their little braces and their little you know, flip phones because they're not old enough to have a smartphone and then go on to become uh, seniors and now graduates. And um, okay, I got this. It's really special for me. Um, I've got to see them grow. Like Josh said, physically, spiritually, I've seen them accomplish amazing things, becoming, you know, senior class president, um, you know, goal scorers. I've seen them, you know, get the grade, do the thing, and uh, it's really special for me. Um, but you, as a church, have all also seen that in me. If you've been at Antioch long enough, you've actually seen me go from 18 to 28 uh, when I graduated from here. You've also seen me go, if you've been around Antioch long enough, you've seen me go from 10 to 28. Uh, this is actually a picture that Allie Johnson sent to me the other day. Um, look how godly I am. I just, uh, the Adventure Bible, I mean, I'm not even going to look up for the picture. I'm just like laser focused. And nothing's changed since then. I just love the Bible. Can't get enough of it. It's amazing. That's my dad, Lynn Collins, and I don't know who that other boy is, but he looks like a freak. So... <laughs> Um, so, okay, <laughs> here we go. Um, today we celebrate our students, celebrate their growth, their change, and moving on to the next season of life. Uh, today we're actually going to take a break from Ephesians and look at one of my favorite passages in all of Scripture. It's 1 Corinthians 15. Um, I just feel like this, this text is going to breathe life on our seniors as, as they go, our church, as we continue to follow Jesus and walk in his ways. Um, and it's also Senior Sunday, so I get to do whatever I want, okay? So that's what we're doing, okay? So if you can, uh, open up to, or turn on your Bibles, whatever it is that you do, to 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 11, okay? Now you're like, I just know Ephesians. And I'm like, okay, you, me either. So uh, here we go. We're going to do 1 Corinthians. Here's a little context for you, okay, so we can prepare for where we're going. You know, a lot of times we just drop into a text and you're like, I have no idea what any of this means, even if you tried to explain it to me. So here's the thing surrounding our text, okay? Um, so Paul right now in 1 Corinthians, um, he's speaking to a church. He's giving a lot of corrections, a lot of reminders. It's a lot of brokenness, weirdness. There's lots of sin happening in their church. There's incest. There's Christians suing each other. There's all sorts of problems. Doesn't that make you feel better about our church a little bit? You're like, okay, we're doing okay. Paul, towards the end of his letter, kind of takes a deep breath and he says, out of all the weirdness, the problems, maybe even the sin in your own life, the sin around you, the problems in our world around you, Here's what to remember. He will remind us of the greatest news one can ever hear. And that's the gospel. Okay? Problem, sin, solution, the gospel. Okay? So let's read it together. Now, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, as of first importance, what I also received. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. That he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. That he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive. 
though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to the apostles, last of all, as to one untimely born, me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preached, and so you believed. Let's pray. So Father, I pray that you remind us of the gospel, that it would not just be an academic ascent, that we would understand some concepts and ideas but the truth of your gospel would permeate our hearts. It would fill us up. It would remind us of our first love with you. That you died for sinners once and for all. And people that accept that truth can have peace with you. Lord, help us remember this. Help us remember that this truth is not secondary, tertiary, but it is of primary importance, God. Lord, fill us up. Remind us. And help us not believe in vain. Lord, we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. All right, reminders are good. They remind us of really important things all the time. If Testerman Dental did not send out their annual teeth cleaning appointment, I would have wooden teeth like George Washington, okay? If I did not get reminders on my phone about taking out the trash, I would have like a little village of raccoons in my shed, Okay, reminders are very, very important. If you uh, didn't have social media and weren't reminded of other people's birthdays, you wouldn't know when other people's birthdays were and you'd burn a lot of bridges, okay? And so this is your reminder that my birthday was this weekend, okay? So if you haven't told me yet, you can just come find me. Um, <laughs> Paul begins this section of scripture with this in verse one. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you. Reminders are good things as followers of Jesus. Isn't this the way that we counsel each other? Whenever we meet with another brother or sister that's in sin, what do we lead with? Not, ah, you'll be fine. You're great. Just, just look inward. You know, you're a great person. You're great. We don't do that as believers. We remind each other of the gospel. The friend, in your feeling of your weight of sin, no. You've been paid for and ransomed by Jesus. Isn't that what we, what we do? We remind each other of the good news of Jesus. Whenever we feel broken down, beaten down by sin, we remind each other of the truth of Jesus. We know that our spouses love us, but we need to be reminded of it. We know that our parents are proud of us, but we need to be continually reminded of it. We know that Jensen is the best preacher at Antioch, and sometimes we need to be reminded of it, like today, okay? So here's your reminder, all right? Uh, <laughs> sorry, I was expecting more laughter, but it's fine, because, you know, anyways. Um, today will serve as a reminder for all of us in the gospel. In fact, in many ways, today is part two of last Sunday's service. Last Sunday, we talked about the gospel, that we were once dead and disobedient, but God, being rich in mercy, made us spiritually alive with Christ. That he gave us a new nature, a new joy, a new hope because of his life, death, and resurrection on the cross. However, if we've been deeply changed by God, we still wrestle today with our flesh that we're trapped in. We also wrestle today with the world around us, right? Once we start following Jesus, it doesn't mean everything becomes perfect. Certainly things become better, but not perfect. This is why I believe that Paul will take, a time, take the time and a letter to remind Christians of the gospel. Amongst all of our sin and brokenness, amongst cultural norms and ever-changing belief systems, Paul tells the believers at Corinth, remember the unchanging good news of Jesus. So here's how we're going to tackle today. We're going to start with verses 3 through 11, and then we'll drop back to verses 1 through 2. 
Okay, sound good? All right, let's go there. So this is sort of our little roadmap. Number one, um, we're going to start with what is the gospel. That's verses three through uh, nine. Verses 10 through 11, second, we're going to see how Paul responded to the gospel. Okay, third, we're going to jump back up to the top and see how the Corinthians responded to the gospel. Okay, and then four, how we are to respond to the gospel, okay? So let's start there, verses three through nine. What is the gospel? This is a critical question, right? It's the question all of us need to know at the end of our lives, right? We need to know the gospel. It's critical for us. It's not just critical for us at the end of our lives, it's critical for us as we live as Christians. But sadly, I think honestly, if someone were to come up to you on the street and say, sir, what is the gospel? We might struggle with answering that question. And so today, let's bring clarity to that, okay? I remember in high school, I went to FCA, and the speaker, sadly it wasn't Josh Chastain, but the speaker asked me, asked all of us, he said, what is the gospel? And me, coming from, you know, a... Bible, awesome church like Antioch, you know, I shot my hand up and I'm like, oh. he's like, yes. I was on the FC leadership team. I was high caliber. Varsity Christian, JV Christian, it was me. And I was like, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And he goes, <laughs> I asked, what is the gospel? And I just dropped my head. And that day, I deconverted. I was out. I'm, I'm just joking. <laughs> no, but I didn't know what he meant when he said, what is the gospel? And I think if many of us were to be asked that question, we wouldn't really know how to answer it. Okay? Paul tells us here in verse 3 and 4. For I delivered to you, listen to these words, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. That he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Paul then reminds them of the gospel they received. That he received. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. This is the good news or gospel. That Jesus died for our sins. Now sadly, there is a lot of confusion as to what is the gospel because there are people that call themselves pastors, that work in places, that call themselves churches, that say that Jesus died for your happiness, your health, your wealth. These people are liars. And it confuses us because we have access to these people. The little Instagram algorithm knows that many of you are probably followers of Jesus. You see this come up on your timeline. And you kind of think, well, I know God is kind, so therefore this must be true. This is not true, right? Your biggest problem is not your lack of money. It's not your nine to five, right? You hear people talk about, you know, what's your Pharaoh? What's your Red Sea that needs to be parted? Your biggest problem is not your circumstances, it's not the world around you. Your biggest problem is actually you in your own sin. This is the biggest problem. There's also confusion around the gospel because we can oversimplify it, right? When we oversimplify it, we actually can potentially lose the whole thing, right? I have a lot of shirts like this in my closet. I know many of my students do. What I'm about, do you guys know what I'm about to say? There's a lot of shirts that say, Jesus loves you, right? Is this true? Yes. But here's the problem. If we boil the gospel down to just Jesus loves you, we can lose the whole thing. Because consider this. If we were to take that gospel at face value and just believe that Jesus loves all people, then surely he will never judge anyone he will take everyone into his arms. And the truth is, is that God will not. He will not. Because he is a judge. And he has to judge us. 
There's a story of a pastor who spoke at a university in Europe. Talking with some of the students, he asked them, do you know what your biggest problem is? And they said, no, what is it? He said, God is good. And the students looked at him and they said, what do you mean? How is that bad? That's, that's a great thing. He said, no, it's not. Because you are not good. The reason why the good news of Jesus is not just that he loves you, it's so much more. In fact, telling someone God loves you is like watching the end of a movie where all things get resolved without any problems or context. The end can be exciting, but for the most part, it can be meaningless. A more complete gospel would be this. God is good, and he demands goodness. He has the law of the Bible he judges us based on. One day, there will be a great judgment where he will capture you and bring you in like a prisoner of war. You've fought on the wrong side. You've turned your back on him. You've broken his law. One day, he will bring you into his courtroom. He'll take out two pieces of paper, one with his law written on it, the other with everything that you have done. He will stack the two against each other. Then he'll look at you. He will look at the first, back at the second, then at you, and he will slam his gavel and declare you what? Guilty. He'll get up and he'll leave the courtroom. Case closed. This is not just your story. It's not just your story. This is all of our stories. God is good. He has to judge. In our minds, we can think of a lot of people that ought to be judged. But it is funny. When we think about the person we know best, we think they're fine. Friends, I don't want to tell you everything that I've done. And I'm sure you don't want to tell me everything you've done. But I know that God knows those things. And he must judge us. But your story doesn't have to end there. The bailiff walks across the courtroom to lead you to your death that you rightfully got. Just as the cuffs wrap around your wrist, the back door opens up. The judge walks back out. This time, not in his judge gown, but he's wearing an orange prison jumpsuit a lot like your own. Smiling at you, he walks over to you. He moves you, and he puts the cuffs on himself and is led away. As he passes his judge stand, he takes your record, one that says everything that you have ever done, good and bad, and he takes it with him to his death. Friends, the only way you can be saved is you acknowledge your hopelessness and that you fall into the arms of the one who died for you. Notice that this story is not just one that is trying to stir up your emotions. This is a real historical fact that Jesus took on flesh, was fully God, was fully man, came down, lived a life that you were supposed to live, and died the death that you deserved so you can go free. So many times I meet with students and they talk to me and they tell me, Jensen, I don't feel like God really loves me. Friends, I want you to know and feel and experience the love of God. Paul even prays that in Ephesians. But the way that you do that is not by stirring up your own emotions and trying to feel it in worship or whatever it is, but it is remembering that it is a fact. It's not subjective. It's not based off of opinion that Jesus really loves me. It is a fact because Jesus really did die. He was buried and he was raised again. Jesus does love you. He really loves you, and he's proven it. So on the days that you don't feel like he loves you, you can rest in the fact that Jesus has died for you. The only way you can be saved is acknowledging your hopelessness. He's proven it. 
He loves you, and he will save you because Jesus satisfied God's hatred for sin. Look with me now at verse 5. He appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, last of all as to one untimely born. He appeared also to me, for I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Paul here is pretty much doubling down. He's saying, this gospel is not only good, but it is a historical event that actually happened. We saw it with our own eyes. The amazing thing about the Bible is that it is written by eyewitnesses during the time of other eyewitnesses. Paul names other eyewitnesses and is like, you don't believe me about Jesus? Go talk to Cephas. Go talk to James. Go talk to 500 others that saw him. Okay, you think that they're lying? I was literally murdering Christians, me, as Paul, and now my life has been completely flipped upside down. Most importantly, how about you find Jesus' body? Find it, and I will recant my faith. Friends, culture today, students in college, your professors will start off in weird land. They'll start off in weird land and say, well, you know, how can this random obscure event Therefore, Jesus isn't alive anymore. I remember, I'll give you an example. I remember in eighth grade, I was on the FCA leadership, le- leadership team. I remember um, a student came up to me and she goes, Jensen, if dinosaurs were on the ark, how can Jesus be real? And I was like, mind grenade moment. I was like, well, how does that even, I don't even understand that. People will say these things as if it is the main pillar to fall, of the, that the, the main pillar to hold up the whole Christian faith. Friends, the main pillar of the Christian faith is that Jesus rose again. You prove to me that Jesus didn't rise again, I will recant my faith. Look at Matthew 28, 6. I'll read it for you. It's on the screen. He, Jesus, is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. Colleges and culture will ask you, how is Christianity any different from other world religions? Christianity is different because the tomb of Buddha is filled. The tomb of Muhammad is filled. The tomb of Confucius is filled. And friends, the tomb of Jesus is empty. He lives. Don't you see why this would be of a first importance? God cannot pardon. He must judge. He judged a man under the weight of his wrath, and he lived. God judged. He judged himself under the weight of his own wrath. You think the only person that can hold back the wrath of God is who? God. And that's what happened. And that weight was your weight. Jesus took it on. He stopped the punishment that was deserved for us. So you can go free. Why? Not because you were a good person. Not because you deserved it. But because of love. God does love people. The cross is not just a picture of covering your sins. It is a picture of both God's hatred for sin, the brutality of it, and love for people. Not only that, but the cross represents what man's life can be. Those who on their own will surely die under God's wrath. But with Jesus' life, you being in tow to Jesus' life, Jesus' righteousness, Jesus' goodness, you will live. Why? Because he lives. This is the gospel. The Father's view of the Son is how he views you in many ways. He loves us more than we could ever imagine. He has seated us at the right hand of God. We are co-heirs with Christ. This news is truly good. So what does it look like to respond to this good news? This good news demands a response. So we're going to look now at how Paul responded to the gospel, then the Corinthians, 
and then us. Okay? Verse 10 through 11. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preached, and so you believed. I remember growing up in school, uh, maybe I have even some of you in class, uh, some t- I know a lot of Lebanon teachers go here. I would go to the grave for teachers that conveyed their care for me, that wanted to help me, that were kind towards me. I'd do it all, you know, do all the homework assignments, I'd study, you know, well behaved in class, I'd wait to, you know, say something, raise my hand. But the opposite was true if a teacher did not care for me. I would make their lives a living nightmare. (laughs) It was awful, right? I would lie to them. I would cheat on their tests. I would pinch them on their butts. If you know that story, I've told that a couple. It's kind of my go-to sermon illustration. (laughs) I was bad. I was a rascal, to be honest. Sorry to use the language. But um, how does Paul respond to the gospel? How does he respond to a good God? It changed him. It led to action in his life. We would call this repentance. He turned away from his old life and ran hard into new life. He worked harder than any of the other apostles and preached this good news. It led to a real response in his life. Last week, David mentioned this quote. Uh, it's from Martin Luther. Um, it says this, we are saved by faith alone, but the faith that saves is never alone. Friends, real belief leads to real change in your life. This was Paul's response. How did the Corinthians respond to the gospel? Let your eyes now travel back to verses one and two. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved if you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. Paul here is talking to Christians. I know it seems silly to point that out, but it is important to consider why Paul would share with a group of Christians what is the gospel. Just like the trash or a dentist appointment or a loved one's birthday, we forget really important things all the time, don't we? It seems to me that many times in modern churches, we see the gospel a lot like going through driver's education, right? Driver's ed is absolutely necessary in driving. But once we start driving, we forget everything that we've learned. We feel it only, it's like a a crossing of a threshold, and that's it. Friends, knowing the gospel is not just a license to go to heaven It's an engine that fuels our whole lives. It's the thing that we're going to be worshiping in heaven with, right? Thank you, Jesus. You've taken away my sin, and I get this, a broken, dirty sinner, now turned into a loved one of yours, a holy one. That's the best news ever, and that's what we're going to be singing forever. And if you don't love that now, you will hate eternity. The Corinthians did not simply receive the gospel, they stood on it. They held fast to it and were changed by it. That's what Paul means when he says, by which you are being saved. What does this mean? Jensen, are you saying that like, God hasn't officially saved me? Like if I do enough bad things, then I'm out? No, that's not true. He's already clarified that in earlier chapters of Ephesians. Okay, he's already clarified that in 1 Corinthians in the beginning. So what does this mean? God has saved us from our sin once and for all. He's removed the penalty of eternal judgment for us. Case closed. His record is now our record. That's it. But friends, we know this is that we still live in a sinful, broken world. We're incarcerated in our flesh. And there's kind of two sides of things. You can have a defeatist mentality that says, you know, I'll never get free from sin. I'll never, I can't get rid of this. And that's a lie. But it is also a lie to say, once you follow Jesus, you are now perfect. 
You are positionally perfect before the eyes of God, but we must continue to be saved. We must continue to be saved from what? Sin. Paul is saying that if you receive this good news, it requires action that we are continually, as Christians, getting free from sin every day. The churchy word here is sanctification. The expectation is that we are to get free from sin more and more in our lives through the power of God. If you believe in this gospel that we just talked about, then you have the spirit of God living in you and you're able to live in new ways. The book of Romans says that you were once slaves of sin, now you are slaves of righteousness. You were in bondage of sin, now you're in bondage of righteousness. If you want to know if you are truly saved, ask yourself, are you being saved? Are you putting to death sin in your life? Do you hate your sin? Are you persevering in temptation? Are you standing on the gospel and others says you're crazy? How we are to respond to this gospel, okay? How are we? What do we do now? Okay, so I want to speak now. I don't usually do this, but because of the unique Sunday, I'm going to speak now to our seniors, okay? Though I have graduates in mind in what I'm about to say, this applies to all of us, very much so. Seniors, congrats. You made it. As you go, I want to remind you of the gospel. It's the good news that Jesus has made peace between you and him. He died for your sins so you can go free. He has dealt with your sin once and for all. He doesn't just put up with you now. He loves you. He's deeply involved in your life. He's leading you. He's watching out for you. He's praying for you. He's thinking about you. You have a relationship with him where he wants you to come to him with things. He wants to hear your joys. He wants to hear your pains. Even in your sin, he wants you to come to him with it. It's always come back to me. It's never get away. He loves you. Don't forget that Jesus has saved you from sin and he is saving you from sin. Charles Spurgeon once said this, you cannot sin more than God can forgive. No matter where you go these next years, know that God is a pursuing God. He loves you. Don't navel gaze. Don't reflect on all that you've done. Take that record and give it back to him if you're a follower of Jesus. He is just and good and will forgive you. Okay. This relationship with God can be fulfilling and soul satisfying. However, there is a sense the gospel can be in vain. You can waste knowing the gospel. Paul emphasizes this phrase, in vain. He says it once in reference to the Corinthians and again talking about himself. Look at verse two. And by which you are being saved if you hold fast to the word I preached to you unless you believed in vain. And then verse 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am and his grace toward me was not in vain. What does this mean? This word in vain, this phrase means to do something without purpose, cause, or without effort. Belief in the gospel is without purpose if our lives don't live it. Though the gospel is personal, it is never private. My biggest regret about my first year in college is that I kind of scoped out the spiritual environment at Sanford University. I kind of saw the, the people that were on fire for Jesus. I saw the people that were far from the Lord, and I found a sweet, happy middle. I watered down my faith and lived a comfortable, culturally Christian life. I thought that getting both the world and Jesus would bring me life. In fact, it brought me death. You can't have your cake and eat it too. 
Riding the fence made everything like salt water. Sin was bitter to me because I knew the truth about Jesus. And then going to church on Sunday felt like garbage because of all the things that were stealing away my affections from Jesus because of what I was choosing to do. There is a sense that believing the gospel, or knowing the gospel, can be in vain, excuse me. Neither the world or Jesus sounded good. I was in the valley, I needed to make a decision, either live for all the world has to offer, or accept the abundant life of Jesus. Seniors, I say this as a word of caution about the future, not a warning about what I see currently. College and the workforce can be a challenging time, but I know you're up for it. I'm so proud of each one of you. I'm so proud of how you guys have shared the gospel with others, served our church, hijacked graduation ceremony to talk about Jesus. <laughs> Y'all have truly, truly changed our city. And in many ways, Paul's ministry to the Corinthians has been my ministry to y'all. A ministry of reminding. Reminding you of the gospel these past five years. I've been far from perfect, but I've worked hard to remind you of the gospel. I've tried to remind you that stacked up against his law, we're doomed. But with his love, you're free, loved, and powerful. Seniors, thank you for receiving the gospel from me. Thank you for an amazing five years. Now, go, stand, hold fast, and preach so that many can believe. Class of 2023, grace to you, Antioch, grace with you. Let's pray. So Father, we thank you for this deposit of the gospel in each of our seniors' life. Thank you for the gospel in our own lives. That you would take enemies and make them your children. Thank you for confirming that Jesus was satisfactory in appeasing your wrath, that you've held back your wrath, your anger and hatred towards sin, and now you love us with the affections of Jesus. You love us more than we could comprehend, think, or imagine. And now you are able to do abundantly more than we can ask or think. God, send these students out. Use them. <laughs> God, use us that we would continue their work in Lebanon, that we would continue to hold fast, to stand firm in this truth, that we would continue to be saved by the gospel. Jesus, thank you for walking with us and loving us, even though we do not deserve it. Lord, help us not look horizontally or internally, but help us look vertically to you, the one who saved us, loves us, and is empowering us. Lord, we love you and we thank you for today. In Jesus' name, amen.